Hello and welcome to the second floor of the George H.W. Bush Gallery here at the National Museum of the Pacific War. Today we're going to feature a lot of the small arms from World War II that we have in our collection, beginning with a sampling of Arisaka rifles that we have. Um, my good friend and colleague Aaron Verinder is here with us. And uh, Aaron, what have you got to begin with here? What I have is the original design Type 30 Arisaka. Uh, it was designed in 1897 and put in production in 1898. Lasted all the way to the end of the war in 1945. It looks like we've got some uh, some evolution in the Arasaka line. What's yes, the, we do. So this after the war in Manchuria, there was a need to change and modify the weapon after the soldiers came back and said, this is wrong. So Nambu was contracted to rede redefine and redesign the weapon. This was designed in 1911, issued in 1912, a cavalry rifle called the Type 44 with a retractable bayonet. So you, that was a unique feature about this. It did have flaws. This was too heavy and it resonated when you fired it and it did with accuracy was limited. So when that came about, they decided to remove the bayonet and move to the Type 38, which is this weapon here. And they took the bayonet off and it went back to the bayonet being on the side. They were primarily used for cavalry or artillery units or anybody who was out just in a logistical type supply in a vehicle where you needed a short barrel. So that's the life of the Arasaka carbine from 1897 to 45. Well, Aaron, we've seen, the, we've seen the carbines. Let's take a look at some of the other Arasakas that we have here, starting with this Top 38. Mm -hmm. So this is a, another configuration of the Type 38 carbine, but it's the full size length barrel. And it has a dust cover, which was asked to add by the Japanese troops in Manchuria because mud and dirt would get in there and their actions wouldn't work. So Nambu added that. He uh, changed the sight, increased distance, and then added a cleaning rod full size. And then your sight guard and your your safety was now rounded off instead of the hook because the hook would grab onto stuff from the Type 30. So you had a five, five round box magazine and it shot six five by 50 Japanese. Now, this is a Type I. What, what is unique about this particular one? It looks awfully similar, but what's unique about this So one? the uniqueness of a Type I is that it was made by the Italians for contract with the Japanese Navy. The reason for that is the Army took over the contract on this and they had priority. So the Navy was without weapons. So they contracted Beretta and several other Italian companies to make the Carcano Type I, which is a Type 30, 38 design with a Carcano action. And that was done in 1938. All right. It looks like we've got a few more down here. Aaron, looks like we've got a, a, a Type 99 right here. Mm -hmm. This looks uh, a little bit more advanced. Yep. What can you tell us about this one? So the Type 99 was the jump from 6.5 caliber to 7.7. So they went to 7.7 Japanese caliber, added a monopod to increase the stability. How does that work? Oh, it just clips open and they can sit it on a rock. Oh, okay. A little, uh, mm. And then it gives them a little more uh, stability so they can fire long distances. The reason why they went to a caliber up. Your sight is also unique. It has uh, anti-aircraft wings on it, so you can shoot at aircraft. And how you do that is you lead it on each side wherever the aircraft is going, and then you fire accordingly. How about that? Mm -hmm. So there's quite a few advances on this one. Yes, the Type 99 was a jump to, to, to get with the modern uh, rifle. All right, now, this is also a Type, a type 99, but tell me about this. So as the war went on, resources declined manufacturing areas declined. So what they did was they contracted individuals to make these rifles in their backyard with very very little materials at all. So you can see the difference between the two. There's less wood. The front sight loses its protection. There's no more cleaning rods. The rear sight is no longer uh, adjustable. It's just a small pinhole. Your, your receiver was probably forged in a kiln in a backyard, so it's untrustworthy. It could it'd blow up in your face. The bolt has less material, and your trigger has less material, and you can even see the butt plate is no longer steel. It is a wooden tab nailed onto the stock. 
Last ditch effort. They're Last running, ditch effort. Running out of supplies. From there at 44 the end of the war. to 45. What is this? So we're now we're moving into their uh, their only small arm, fully automatic submachine gun, and this is the Type 100, and this one is a last ditch, hence your tang sight and your front sight has no protection whatsoever. It's just a welded metal piece of steel, and your butt plate steel is wood. a wooden stamped on. Magazine is probably the, the the best piece on here, but you can tell by the welds, that's, that's a last ditch uh, manufacturing right there. And this was an autom a fully automatic? Fully automatic and it was an eight millimeter, the same as their pistol. Okay, all right. Well, this was a, this was a, a brief look at, at the variety of Arasakas that we have in the collection. Uh, Aaron, I've got a lot of other weapons from other nations. You wanna go take a look at some of those? Yes, sir. All right, let's go. Okay. Well, Aaron, it looks like we have got a variety of submachine guns here. What do you want to start with right now? Well, we're going to start with a German MP35, which was pretty rare. It had the wooden buttstock, shot nine millimeter, stick magazine on the side. And it was issued to small units, wasn't very, very widely used. What about this one here? This, well, this looks like the... an MP44 to me. Yeah, this is the mainstay of the German military at the end of the war. Kind of like an last ditch effort, but it was a really good one. Um, you basically is a magazine, 30 round magazine that shot a rifle caliber, eight millimeter, but it was, the casing was shortened. So it could fit in a magazine like this. It wasn't big, the big giant box magazine. And it, it was able to break, break down shotgun style so you can clean the weapon rapidly. And it, it was basically your, your light infantry uh, submachine gun for close quarter combat within urban areas. Okay. Looks like we've got another uh, another Italian manufacturer right here. Yes, this looks we like have a Beretta. the Beretta. And this this particular Beretta has a dual trigger system, so you can fire single shot or full auto, and it shoots nine millimeter. And it's a single stick magazine that goes in the base, not un unlike your side stick over there. So the Beretta one was a was an excellent rifle, and it was used widely amongst the Italians okay. and the Germans. The Germans used them as well. Okay, looks like we've got something. These two almost look like uh, yes. more of our submachine guns. What yeah. do we have here? It's called Aaron? hybridization. Uh, hybridization is basically when in North Africa, the Australians brought the MP40, which is the famous uh, machine gun the Germans used. Uh, mostly officers and NCOs had them. Shot nine millimeter like everything else that we have on the table besides the Strumgewehr. But it, <clears throat> it became, it evolved into the Sten. The Australians used the internal firing pin system. They added a pistol grip and they used the same similar folding stock. And, but it was a side stack magazine. So you basically side fed your magazine and you could hold on to it that way. And then the Germans had the single stack straight on the bottom. All right. Well, these are, these are uh, submachine guns from the Axis powers. We've got a couple of uh, allied submachine guns we'll take a look at later. Looks like we have a few more bolt action rifles here from other nations as well. This, you want to start with this Mauser? Yes, this is the K98 Mauser. Basically, it's considered a carbine, but it's kind of a mid range. Has the top sight, shoots 8 millimeter. Bolt action. Now, this particular Mauser action has been copied by every country in the world almost. So it's the mainstay in the, in the basically what everybody copied and targeted. Then we jump into our Mark V carbine Enfield. Now this so, one was British. British, British. yeah. You got yeah. the British Enfield, and it was used in the Burma campaign, but the Brits hate it because this front sight bayonet flash sighter resonated and the accuracy was horrible. Mm. But they used them. They did what they did. And then what finally our, yes, we have the, the Russian Mosin Nagant, 1891. So this was a carbine commonly used by the Russians, heavily used in the Manchuria campaign in, in towards Japan. And uh, it shot a 7.62 by 54 and very loud. Uh -huh. <laughs> Out of all these weapons, this will hurt your hearing. But you can see how basic the bolt is. No safety. You basically, you pull the trigger and you release the bolt, but there's no like this has a flip up safety, this has a flip up safety. This is just pull the trigger, point it to the ground and kind of release the pin forward slowly. 
So safety wasn't a big deal on that design. <laughs> All right, well, I've got some American weapons that we ought to take a look at next. How about it? Yeah, yeah. let's go. Aaron, looks like we've got a variety of American submachine guns. Where would you like to begin? Well, I would love to begin with our Thompson 1928, which is this gun here. All right. Um, this is what was used at the beginning of the war. And it had a transition out of this weapon because of the weight and the expense to build it. So design teams make it lighter, much more easier to manufacture. Top cock, side cock. So you, you go back and forth and you're not having to look through that while it's shooting. So this evolved into the best gun ever, which is the M3 grease gun. And what they did was they slowed down the rate of fire. They added a side cocking lever, but eventually that was evolved out of the gun and it became totally evolved after that. But that was later in the war. But this, this gun was easier to, to produce. Um, materials were less. You can exchange the barrel from 45 to 9 millimeter, and these were 45 only. So this is the ultimate battle implement on the submachine gun side. Okay. And then you come to this monstrosity. I do not like this one. This is called the Ryzen. Marines didn't like them, so as soon as they were issued, they dumped them in the ocean. But your cocking lever's down here, magazines fed this way, and the, the chamber was so tight, you got sand or rocks in there, you might as well give it up, it's not gonna fire. And when they hit the beach, the gun was worthless. It, it required severe cleaning for it to keep operating. Not ideal for the conditions. Not ideal in the for Pacific. the conditions, but this one was. Okay. A lot of room. Looks like we've got uh, an oldie but a goodie, the uh, 1903 Springfield. Aaron, what do you know about this one? Well, this individual rifle was basically the early one because the front sight was forward. The later models, they were back. Um, it's basically off a of Mauser action. It's a hybrid, just like most rifles become. Shot 30 out six, five box magazine. And after it hit Guadalcanal, the Marines had them and they got rid of them as fast as they can. What did they use to replace? Well, the Army showed up with this beautiful thing called the M1 Garand. Oh. And this particular rifle, everybody loved. Eight shots in a clip, which an end block is what they called, which means all together. You put your eight rounds in, you slap that semi-automatic bolt closed, and you had eight shots at the tip of your finger. So no bolt to have No to. bolt to have to worry about. You no can bolt put rounds on, on target as quick as you can. All right. Well, that sounds like a, a real leap forward. Everything yes. else yep. we've seen, is, except for the subs, yep. submachine guns, have been bolt action Yes, rifles. they have. So that's, I imagine and, this was And then we, we, had, an we had to have a baby version. Oh. So we came out with the M1 carbine, which shot a 30 caliber round, which was basically typical what you would call a pistol round, yeah. but it had about a, as much power, or a little more than a 357 mag. Okay. So this one's the M2 version, which means it was fully automatic with a selector switch. So you could go single shot or full auto with just one switch. Okay. And it had a, added a bayonet, because in the originals they didn't have bayonets until later in the war. Looks quite a bit smaller and lighter yep. than the M1 Garand. It was given to officers, mortarmen, truck drivers, tank drivers, and other crews that needed something small. Now, who would have carried this? Now, this is your, the folding your paratroopers. Oh, and yeah. yes, they had paratroopers in the Pacific War. They yeah. hit Corregidor. Love Boy, that them. was an operation. Yeah. So they would have a folding stock because it was mounted on the side or on their gear. Okay. So when they before they hit the ground, they dropped their gear so they wouldn't land on it. Okay. So compact pistol pretty much all right now I've got some uh, heavier hitters you want to take a look at some yes, of those yes, let's all right through. let's get let's get some of those it looks like we've got a selection of light machine guns now why are these considered light machine guns well a heavy machine gun is crew served and a light machine gun is can be operated by one individual okay what do we have here so what we have here is a Bren it's a mark one it's the early one it shot 303 who manufactured these or who used these? The British. This British. is a British operated weapon. Okay. Um, they were sold to other countries, but the Brits are, is a primary Brit issued uh, weapon. Okay. This looks awfully similar. It does look similar, but it is not. What do so we have here? People think that the this is a Type 99 Japanese Nambu. Okay. Designed by Nambu himself. It was chambered in 6.5, but now they jumped up to 7.7, which is the similar caliber to the Bren. Now, which one of these is the copy of the other? Neither. Neither. They're a copy of the CZ, oh. 
okay. with, with the checks had designed. So they were both utilized off of that CZ design. Okay. Top fed magazine, offset sights, and these share a similar caliber bullet. Okay. Moving on to the to the Browning automatic rifle. I recognize this one. Yes. Tell the, us a little about the, the good BAR. the 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 1918 BAR. It was designed for uh, World War One, but it was at the end of the war, so it then eventually made it from World War One to World War Two, and it became a, a single individual served machine gun for your platoon. So it was your squad automatic weapon, basically. And a 20 round Bach magazine, 30 out six. And if you needed to lay down suppressing fire or, or put some heavy uh, equipment down, this is the weapon to use. Mm -hmm. All right. Hey, that was a look at a lot of the small arms that we have here in the collection at the National Museum of the Pacific War. I'd like to thank my friend and my colleague, Aaron Verinder, for his expertise and knowledge. And now we'd like to answer any questions that you all may have. Hi everyone, my name is Aaron Schumann. I'm the Museum Experience Coordinator here at the National Museum of the Pacific War. I run our Living History program and after watching that video, I thought, you know, we did a pretty good job of looking at some of the light weapons that we have, uh, the, the smaller firearms, but we didn't really include any of our handguns. No. And so we brought down a couple special uh, bonus weapons for you today. So Aaron, could you talk a little bit about the two bonus weapons we brought down? Sure, well, the first one we're gonna talk about is a uh, Browning 1911. So 45 ACP, seven shot, single stack magazine. And this is the early 70 series. And basically this is the sidearm that a flamethrower would carry, officers would have, or any individual that couldn't uh, carry a large weapon. So the sidearm for the US was 45 ACP, 1911 Browning. And then the Japanese had the Nambu. Type 14. Well, this one is a later model. You can tell by the trigger guard. Manchuria rears its ugly head every time you see a Japanese weapon because the trigger guards of the earlier ones were so small you couldn't put a gloved hand in there so that you can see the expansion so you can stick your big mitten hand in there and actually shoot the pistol. So what's unique about this pistol is there was a certain individual that brought some home and redesigned them in his garage and his name was Ruger. So if y'all are familiar with Ruger weapons, he created the Mark I 22 caliber pistol off of this design. And all he did was reverse engineer it, side, and made the side port instead of the top eject, it was a side eject, and he chambered it in 22 long rifle because the eight millimeter Japanese didn't work very well, jammed a lot, and he tried to stuff nine millimeter in there and it just was, it wasn't practical. So it works great with 22 long rifle. So this little gun is still in service today in everybody's homes. <laughs> well, you know, I, I think it's really exciting to see some of these small weapons, uh, especially because mm -hmm. it just shows the breadth and depth of the different types of uh, firearms that were used in the Pacific War uh, and beyond in the European theater. So I, I do see that we have a couple questions here. Uh, the first one we have is uh, from Keith, and he's asking uh, if we could explain the rationale behind the lack of a safety on that Russian rifle that we had. Well, on the Russian rifle, it was designed by the name on it, Bozen and Nagant. And then uh, the reason why there was no safety, because safety was not a concern when you're going to war. They wanted the weapon as cheap as possible to mass produce it. And Russians had supply line issues. So they did minimal at best, as long as the fire, the weapon fired. And sometimes they couldn't issue them to everybody. So you had more men on the field than rifles. So they didn't want to fumble in the safeties. And it's a training item too. So as soon as they pick up the run, the gun, they load the ammo and they start throwing rounds down range, five shots, if they could get them down without getting killed. You know that uh, the lack of a safety on that one reminds me on the Arasaka, the uh, the very simple safety right. can be operated just, just with twist the, of the hand. Yeah. Like you said, uh, yeah. uh, Aaron's told me many times here uh, about the the very basic safety on Narasaka. It's operated with the palm of your hand by twisting. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, also, like you said, because Manchuria raises its ugly head, mm -hmm. it was very cold there. Yep. If your hands were frostbitten, you needed to be able to turn that safety easily without uh, fumbling on your weapon. So our, our second uh, question comment here uh, is from Aaron. Also Aaron, also mm -hmm. Aaron. Yes. Uh, it says, happy belated Living History Week. Can you talk more about how your collection is used in visitor engagement outside of our exhibits? And yeah, so that, that's a pretty good question for me. Mm -hmm. 
So we have, of course, our main collection, which is seen uh, up at the museum and, and uh, out and about in those areas. But uh, we also have our education outreach collection, uh, which is a, a much smaller collection, but it contains a, a number of artifacts. And uh, I had that collection off and we're able to use those in our living history programs, our educational programs. Uh, we take it out and, and do all kinds of things, everything from outpost programs on a lot of Saturdays, where you can come out, touch, feel, and hold some of these artifacts, uh, to our Pacific Valor programs, where Aaron has these things all ready to uh, go out onto the battlefield and fire blank rounds so you can see what they would have uh, uh, looked like, sounded like, and uh, even in some cases smelled like with the burning gunpowder uh, out on our battlefield. It uh, looks like our next question here, uh, it was, was the M1 Grand well received in the Pacific? That's from Doug. Doug, very much so. Bolt action rifles uh, have a lot of problems. Speed of loading, speed of fire. So when you got an eight round at the tip of your finger weapon, that you can shoot eight rounds just by tapping the trigger without dealing with a bolt, that was much revered. And the Japanese actually tried to reverse engineer that weapon because they saw how great it was on the battlefield. They chambered it in 6.5 by 50, but it never made it to the battlefield. It's still in production. So we lucked out. Mm -hmm. we, we do a really great demonstration in the living history program sometimes with uh, an individual firing blanks from an Arasaka, an individual firing blanks from an M1 Garand. And usually the person with that M1 is going to get eight shots downrange before your individual with the Arasaka is finished with their five. It makes a huge difference when you're talking about uh, a large squad, uh, six, eight guys firing that makes a big difference, total amount of firepower. So looks like our next question here is from Keith. And he says, uh, what in your opinion was the best military handgun for World War II? Was it the 1911? Well, I'm, in my opinion, and I'm biased to the 1911 because of the 45 caliber, but the Luger was no slouch either. Nine millimeter and it, it worked. So, even the Russians had a torque road that was had a lot of power to it, 7, 762 by 25. And uh, the best, I would say the, the, the best uh, probably caliber was the 45 when it's close range. But your, your Russian weapon was pretty good at distance. They have more power. But I would, I would say the 1911 overall. I think my favorite military handgun, it's not really a handgun, but it's kind of your middle ground. Uh, you know, at the beginning of the war, if you had a, a job where you needed your hands, you were a radio operator, pushing an artillery piece, uh, carrying a bazooka, your options were your 1911 or carrying around M1 Garand or a 1903. That really left you with not a lot of options, right? You either have not enough firepower or way more than you needed in a heavy weapon. They came out with that M1 carbine, which is nice and light. I carry one in our reenactments. Honestly, sometimes I go turning around looking for it. It's sitting right on my shoulder. Thing weighs like four four and a half pounds with a, a fully loaded magazine in it absolutely nothing and very easy to maneuver uh so our next question here is from amy and she's asking which tommy gun mag was used the most and uh, i'm sorry amy it was not that big barrel mag that you see so often on movies aaron yeah the, the thompson uh the 50 caliber I mean, the 50 round drum magazine was only allowed uh was capable of used on the 1928 so if you had the older version of the Tommy gun, you could use the 50. But a lot of people loved the 20 because it jammed less. Uh, the 30 round was the most issued. So they, they worked with the 30 round magazine mostly. So our next one is from uh, Jerry, who wants to know, uh, what was the first year that 1911 was phased out and which sidearm replaced it? Wow, that's a sore subject. Well, the, the <laughs> Marine Corps kept the 1911 for a long time. I think just recently, in the last couple of years, they finally phased it out. So they rehashed it, it got redesigned, it got put back into service, contractors picked it up. SIG actually made the last one for for uh, the Marine Corps, but I don't think the Marine Corps has the 45 uh, 1911 style pistol anymore. It was replaced with the SIG uh, 226 possibly. So we have another question here from S. Hayes who wants to know, what was the most accurate allied rifle in World War II? The uh, 1903. So if you go look, do a deep dive in Tarwa's uh, uh, photo archives, there's a Marine with a scoped 1903 sitting on a barrel sniping Japanese with it. So our most accurate uh, weapon on the battlefield was that bolt action 1903. 
and they made, and we actually have a couple of versions in our collection uh, that are set up in that sniper configuration. It's like Reagan said in the film, an oldie, but a goodie. Yes. Um, our next question here is from Reggie Smith. Hello, Reggie. Reggie is our uh, uh, Nambu machine gunner on our battlefield for our living history programs. And he's asking, is there a Japanese machine gun type 94 available in the collection? No, there is not. Sorry, we, Reggie. Yeah, sorry, Reggie. No, no type 94. <laughs> not available. <laughs> and uh, from David here, we have a, a question on the grease gun, Aaron's favorite. Yep. He wants to know, uh, the newer gun had a... Uh, the, char uh, the newer gun and the charging was used by putting your finger on the bolt, then pulling. Did it burn your finger? Oh, all day. <laughs> Once you, well, I mean, a couple of rounds, three rounds down range of that, and you, when you went to charge it, that's why you you either put tape on the tip of your finger or you'd have a glove. So, you know, combat's messy and everything, it's fast. You get tunnel vision, things heat up, things break down at a rapid pace. I see another one here from uh, Joseph. And uh, he says that he has a uh, Type 99 rifle. Uh, it was uh, stamped with the chrysanthemum, which is a symbol of the emperor, of course. The chrysanthemum uh, has been crossed out or etched out. He read that General MacArthur uh, ordered this so as not to offend the Japanese when U.S. troops captured weapons from the arsenals. Is that a true story? That is a very true story because they, they first signed an unconditional surrender, but it became conditional as time went on. So the condition was is it was uh, the emperor... You could not own the emperor's uh, uh, possessions. If it had a, a mum on it, that was his possession. So if it's milled off of the receiver, that means it was it came from an armory and the armor was allowed to shave it off. If you find an air socket with the mum still on it, that is a possible uh, capture from battlefield or it came from an armory that did not get the order in time when they gave up the weapons. So that is a true story. And yes, those those mums were removed on everything. If it had a mom on it, it had to be removed. I will tell you in our collection for our living history programs, we have both weapons with and without. Uh, and that's actually something that we really enjoy showing visitors uh, so they can see that. Uh, we have an, another question there from John. Uh, were model 1917s used in World War II? There were some uh, the Brits used them mostly. I mean, a lot of them were left over in England at the time. And it is considered the Springfield, Enfield type rifle. So they, they were used in service. And I wouldn't be surprised if the Japanese had some. Because they did take Singapore and there were probably mm -hmm. some there. So the Japanese probably got their hands on them as well. And the Japanese had their hands on all kinds of American weapons, everything. right? Thompson submachine guns. When they hit Guam, they took everything. Even They even have our B-17s, and they marked them. It shows it was good equipment. Yep. <laughs> we got a lot of really good questions here. Uh, another one here from Keith says, uh, was the majority of 1911-45 ammunition used in the Pacific Theater steel cased? All the stuff that I've found is all brass. And if you if you do have a World War II era 45 round, if you have the, the round out of the casing, there's a marking on the base of the bullet and it's a U shape. So you 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 I, I didn't I didn't see I haven't seen any steel cased 45 ACP rounds from the Pacific Theater in any of the archives. And I don't I haven't read anything that, that they said they used them. It was mostly brass. Yeah, I can't say I've come across any of that either. Mm -hmm. um, from Larry, uh, he wants to know about the Winchester Model 97. Is Ooh. that the similar Ch question? Ch oh, yeah, so we, we don't have, I, we, we do have Model, model 97. Um, it was used in the Pacific uh, widely, just like it was in the other theaters. Shotguns were really coveted when you're trench clearing, but they're also coveted when you're uh, uh, clearing out fighting holes. Japanese dug in a lot. So if you could get a shotgun, that was a good thing. And we do demo uh, the shotgun use uh, with uh, our assault team when we do the flank throw. Yeah, at our upcoming uh, battle reenactment, Pacific Valor on May 27th, uh, you'll have an opportunity to see uh, one of those uh, shotguns coming out onto the battlefield mm -hmm. behind uh, behind our flamethrower operator. Yes. As an important part of our mm -hmm. program. Uh, we have a question here from Andy, which I, I think we've answered somewhat, but maybe we can expand on it. He asks, was the, the most and the most accurate 
uh, bolt action rifle in the war. Uh, and I, you know, yeah. you, you said oh. 1903, but maybe yeah. talk a little bit about what differentiates those. So two. the Mosin has a, a quite uh, a unique revolution. So when the Russians invaded Finland in 1939, the Finnish captured quite a few of them. And if you can ever get a hold of a Finnish Mosin, they accurized them. So the most accurate Mosin you can get is a Finnish capture or the M39 Mosin uh, that the Finnish manufactured. Uh, that They're very accurate. Compared to the standard Mosin, uh, we used to shoot competitions with them. We used to call it a shotgun competition because everybody's groups were four inches or greater. But if you got a Finnish, you were tight in the group with good ammo. We have a question here from Michael. He says, how was the sight used on the top magazine guns uh, as far as accuracy? Well, <clears throat> they're offset. You have the front sight and they're, they're offset. The magazine's right here and then your your sights are offset. So they're very accurate. They're aimed at the, at the, at the muzzle. So wherever you point, the muzzle's gone. So uh, the, the Titan 99 Nambu had a scope, a one power scope on it. So that increased the accuracy of that. And they actually could single shoot the 99. So when you're looking down your scope, you put the, the little crosshair on your target and you just tap the trigger and you can nail it. So the, the Nambu was pretty good at that. Yeah, they kind of had to work around that as a little bit of an engineering challenge mm -hmm. for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, and then we have just one more question here from Doug. He wants to know what we think of the Tokarev SVT-40. Ooh, well, that's the uh, what they call the Russian M1 Garand. Uh, the, those SVTs, 40s, shot 7.62 by 54. Um, they they were widely used, and they, they were effective. They worked very well. And the, the German G, G43 was the same similar weapon as well. So it was a box magazine fed semi-automatic rifle. Well, I think that about wraps up the, the questions that we have there in our chat box. So thank you, Aaron, for sure. sharing all that information. Thank you, all of you, for tuning in. Uh, if you were interested in this program, you might find uh, our program next month, our next webinar, very interesting. It's a subject near and dear to my heart, and that is uh, how we actually clean and maintain and oil and work on these 80-year-old uh, firearms that we still get to use in some cases in our Living History program. So uh, please go to our website, register for that event. Keep an eye on your inbox for your uh, survey regarding this uh, webinar here. And uh, thank you so much again for attending and have a great rest of your day.